In St. Mark's Square in Venice, Italy, is a statue of four men carved of porphyry, the purple-colored stone much loved by the emperors of the Roman Empire. The statue depicts four men, their right hands gripping the shoulders of their colleagues and their left hands on their sword hilts. The men depicted are Diocletian and his co-rulers, the men who would transform and stabilize the Roman Empire and bring the crisis of the 3rd century to an end. The man known as Diocles was born around 244 near the town of Salona in the Roman province of Dalmatia. During his early years, the Roman Empire was divided, racked by civil war, and constant political and economic chaos. In 284, when he succeeded Numerian as emperor of the Roman Empire, he changed his name from the Greek Diocles to the Latin form of Diocletian. Diocletian built upon the reforms of previous emperors, notably Gallienus and Aurelian, and in doing so, reworked the government of the Roman Empire. It had simply grown too large to be able to manage effectively, and so, lacking a son, he chose a fellow army officer, Maximian, to join him as co-emperor. There was, technically speaking, no formal division of power among the two men, but in practice, Diocletian governed the eastern portions of the empire, while Maximian was in charge of the western half. To bring peace and order back to the empire, Maximian's first objective was the pacification of Gaul, where groups of armed peasants and mobs exerted local power. We know these groups as the Bogare, although we aren't entirely certain what their aims were. It may very well have just been local defense leagues, although the stereotype of gangs of bandits and rebels may also to a degree hold true. While doing this, Maximian dispatched one of his underlings, an army officer by the name of Carousius, to secure the coast of the English Channel. Success was quick in both cases, and before the dust had settled on the battlefields, Carousius declared himself Emperor of Northern Gaul and Roman Britain. Diocletian and Maxentius' reigns were steeped in mythological propaganda, with official speeches and artwork depicting Diocletian as Jupiter and Maxentius as Hercules, giving a divine aspect to their rule. Indeed, the old system of doing things, whereby the emperor was merely first citizen, was done away with, and Diocletian and Maxentius were now to be addressed as Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. In order to even get an audience with them, one needed to prostrate oneself before the throne and completely submit, and even then, that audience might not be granted. In this system, there was no room for a third party, at least not yet. Nevertheless, Diocletian understood that more flexibility was required, and so he appointed two more underlings, Galerius, who served under him, and Constantius, who served under Maximian. Diocletian and Maximian would be known officially by the title of Augustus, while the others would serve under them as Caesars. This, hence, becomes the famed Tetrarchy, the rule of four. Ties of unity were emphasized not only in propaganda, but in all aspects of life, as there were marriage alliances between the four. And, with the system now in place, there was no room for Carousius. Constantius quickly moved against him, and the usurper was destroyed. The crisis of the 3rd century revealed many things to Diocletian and his companions. Not only was one emperor not enough, but there were economic and military problems as well that needed to be dealt with and quickly if the Roman Empire was to regain its strength. The organization of the empire was totally reworked from the top down. It was broken into four large administrative units, the Praetorian Prefectures, each controlled by either an Augustus or a Caesar. These were then broken down again into dioceses, which were then further broken down into provinces. For two centuries, the Roman Empire had been governed with a minimal number of men, but now the restructuring required a rapid increase in governmental bureaucracy. Something like 35,000 people, mainly drawn from the equestrian social class, filled the offices. And it was much needed. While the city of Rome remained an important cultural center, the focus was on the frontiers. Thus, the capitals of the Praetorian prefectures moved towards the frontiers of the empire in order to facilitate a more rapid response to problems by the central government. Milan, Ravenna, Trier, Alexandria, Antioch, eventually the city of Constantinople. The capital often moved along with the person of the emperor, but it was always near the crisis zones. The anarchy of the 3rd century had witnessed a drastic rate of inflation to the point that money had, to a degree, essentially been worthless. In order to help run the newly enlarged government and the military, which we'll talk about in a moment, the Tetrarchy's first concern was fixing the coinage and producing revenue. In order to do this, a financial review of the dioceses, provinces, and prefectures was undertaken, and that review would come in two forms. The amount of land the community had, which was measured in a unit known as Ayugara, and which would vary in size based on needs, and the amount of human capital available for labor. 
In most instances, the taxes were imposed in kind, so that rather than money being paid, which was subject to inflation, taxes were paid in a certain number of goods. More mints were constructed, and the coinage was reissued at high levels of gold and silver content in addition to a new copper coin, the Numis, intended for daily monetary needs. This didn't halt the inflation issue, although it certainly helped slow it down, so in 301 Diocletian issued the Edict of Maximum Prices, which set a cap on the prices of all goods. We don't know how effective this actually was, as we have limited evidence, and we can't necessarily extrapolate a great deal from it, although it does suggest that it didn't always work. After all, even with the increased size of the government, regulation cannot be enforced all the time. Much of the revamped currency and taxes paid in kind went towards the new military. The increase in administrative units increased the likelihood of armed rebellion. So, to resolve this issue, the offices of governor and army leader, which prior had largely been one and the same, were separated. Frontiers, or other areas that required the active presence of the military, had a series of fortifications set up to house troops. And the zones in which these troops operated did not always correspond to provincial boundaries. There were some cases where troops in two adjacent provinces could be commanded by the same leader, known as a dukes, from where we get the medieval title duke. The basic distinction in the military was between these frontier troops, known as limitanei, and the troops stationed in cities and towns, known as the comitatensis, commanded by a comes, from which we get the title count. In order for the military to be effective in the late empire, it became much more reactive than it had previously been. The comitatensis contained large units of cavalry in order to facilitate rapid movement against enemies who slipped through the gaps and defenses maintained by the limitanei. Emperors also were highly mobile, and were accompanied by a new unit of cavalry, the Auxilia Palatina. While there was a rise in the number of foreign troops in the military, this doesn't necessarily mean that the late Roman military was a force comprised of mainly foreign, barbarian troops. Many generals end up having non-Roman ancestry, but there isn't really any indication that these commanders or these troops felt any less loyal to the Roman state than natural citizens of the empire felt. In some cases, they appear to have felt more. The civil administration took its cue from this military in terms of rank and titles and in terms of uniform, with one of the key distinguishing characteristics being the cingulum, the belt that soldiers would sling their swords from, but in this case it marked someone out as a civil servant. This is, in brief, an overview of Diocletian's reforms, but a question often asked is, did they succeed? That is, did the reforms of Diocletian successfully strengthen the Roman Empire, or did it simply prolong the inevitable political and economic collapse? I think, on the whole, we must conclude that he was successful. There were, of course, problems. The Edict of Maximum Prices could not be rigidly enforced, nor could other laws such as the decree that children must follow in the careers of their fathers, the sons of bakers must grow up to become bakers, and so on, but what system is not without its own issues? Certainly Diocletian stabilized the empire in ways that the emperors of the previous 50 years could not, except perhaps for Aurelian. The creation of the Tetrarchy and the reorganization of the Roman Empire administrative structure, coupled with the rise in number of governmental employees, allowed for much easier governance and allowed for the burden of rule to be more evenly distributed. Diocletian's insistence on court ritual and an official change in imperial propaganda and ideology ensured that the emperors ruled as well as reigned, and his military reforms, building on those of emperors like Gallienus and continued by men like Constantine, ensured that the Roman Empire had the military strength necessary to respond to a variety of threats, not always successfully, but they were able to respond in ways that they were not able to do so before. The most telling piece of evidence, though, I think, is the fact that Diocletian was able to retire in peace, and Galerius was able to succeed him with little trouble. Compared to the track record of the 3rd century, when emperors were being killed off one after the other, we could not ask for a more meaningful example.